it's not just the understanding you need forgiveness then you have to forgive yourself and you have to forgive the people that might have contributed inadvertently to you being in that place adhd rewired episode 460 this is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, you can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Lori Hollingsworth. Lori was officially diagnosed with ADHD combined presentation about two and a half years ago at the age of 64, having reached retirement without suspecting any neurodivergencies. Yet she always felt herself to be the misfit, Given the expectations set by friends, family, coworkers, and society at large, and forever assumed the role of inadvertent perpetrator with all the guilt inherent therein. Lori will share the arc of her journey shaped by the absence of an ADHD diagnosis in early childhood, which inevitably led to numerous comorbidities over the decades, as well as the never expected hope that she now experiences for her future. Lori, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you very much. Glad to have you here. You know, when uh, when we first spoke, one of the things that uh, you were sharing with me was that you felt it's really so important to get more stories uh, of seniors getting diagnosed, and and I couldn't agree with you more. So thank you for for coming on to share your experiences. It's a pleasure, and it's it almost feels like a duty. Mm. It's it's bigger than me. When you were, uh, when we were first talking, one of the things that you kind of shared with me was that you kind of refer to yourself as a failure, even though you've had a lot of successes. And I think that whether it's you're your 64 getting diagnosed or, you know, 24, I think that that story holds true no matter how old you are. I think that the older you are, though, the the more work that tends to, to need to be sort of done on reflecting and making more sense of the past now that you have this new paradigm or new lens to, to look at it through. What was it that sort of led you to get that diagnosis? Um, <laughs> which part of the story to begin? Um, I guess the most succinct way to put it is my nephew, my brother's son, the, the teachers were saying, you've got to get your son uh, looked at. We think he has ADHD. They went through that process, my brother and his wife, and discovered that he was. My sister-in-law also got diagnosed. It turns out she also has it. And my brother has pretty well, we've always known that he ha has had it, although he never was diagnosed. So it was in the family, but it was like an aberrancy. You know, nobody in the family ever, ever thought that it was genetic and that any of the rest of us had it. It did not occur to us. My brother was telling this story of his son's diagnosis to my husband, not in my presence. And as my brother was describing his son and how he behaved and how he acted and how the diagnosis came about and what kind of, you know, criteria they based the, the, the diagnosis on and all of this stuff, bells are going off in my husband's brain and going, my goodness, that sounds like my wife. Um, my husband and I have been married since 1983. So we have longevity, but it has not been without its challenges. It has been fraught 
with no end of uh, bickering and differences of how to approach things and and of course to say nothing of uh, the memory issues and the you know not doing things in the right order or not finishing things or leaving things on the floor I was considered a danger because I would leave doors open or drawers. I would leave drawers open that people would trip over. And this went on for over 30 years, you know. I, and I, I think the persistent leaving of cabinets uh, and drawers open should be part of the <laughs> diagnostic criteria. <laughs> Absolutely. It is, it's so funny, like when I hear people talk about that specific thing and like it's, it's a a very strong memory of just my childhood. My mom just always being like, how many times do I have to, you know, to tell you to close the cabinets? It's like, well, you've told me about a thousand times already. So probably a few more, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or my mother would say, what, you were born in a barn, you know? <laughs> and of course, the memory issues were probably the most significant issue that affected us as a couple. And my husband had actually asked me to get my memory tested. So this is going back maybe, I don't know, six, seven, eight years. And I had gone and done all of that. And basically, uh, it was a specialist in, in memory uh, things, I, I guess. And she said, look, there's nothing wrong with your memory. Absolutely nothing wrong with your memory. What's wrong is you've got too much on your plate and you're trying to do too much and you're an A-type and just slow down. So that was the, the the prescription. And of course, try and tell what I now know as an ADHD person to slow down. That just that didn't work too well, right? So nothing much ensued from that. And we just continued struggling. So then my husband, uh, this is probably uh, four or five years ago, is now on my back, right? Honey, you have to do something about this. You have to go and see if you have ADHD. Yeah, sure. I have no problem with that because I love my husband and I want things to go well. And sure, why not? However, of course, where does it land in the priority list, right? You've got things to do and you don't realize how serious your husband is about this because he's been very gentle. And it's like, oh yeah, I'll get around to it. So every couple of months, my husband would say, yeah, what have you done about getting a diagnosis, finding somebody to, to uh, look at you? Oh, well, yeah, well, okay, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and then another few months would go by, you know? So literally about two years later, I still haven't done anything about it. And we're in the car. I forget. Oh, yeah, we, we were driving from Canada to Florida because we're snowbirds. So we're in the car and we're doing this long drive and we're talking. And I have no idea for the life of me. I have no idea what we were talking about. But all of a sudden, my husband's fist pounds on the dashboard. That's it. But I can't take it anymore you are going to get diagnosed. And he had like a hairy conniption fit. And that's when I knew that he was serious, that this was not just something that he thought was a good idea, this was an imperative. And I don't know about other ADHDers out there, but sometimes that's exactly what it takes. There's so much stuff going on in that brain and you're trying to juggle so many balls that unless somebody does something drastic yeah. to get your attention, they don't have your attention. I have to say that, you know, that, you know we, we tend to prioritize based on proximity and not priority, but proximity can be whatever is loudest, brightest, most intense, most in your face uh, is the thing that Absolutely. causes, you know, to, which, you know, is why by default, we tend to be good firefighters, you know, in, in the metaphorical oh. standpoint, but like when it comes to, trying to do the thing that uh, we have like three years to actually work on and we wait until the last <laughs> month to get started on it. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah that, that yeah. makes sense. So he was pretty frustrated. Oh, he was beyond frustrated. I mean, he was angry literally. And I mean, with all a good reason, because how many times had he patiently yeah. asked me over two years and it wasn't because I disagreed with him. You know, I thought it was a great idea. 
but I knew it was going to be a learning curve if there was a diagnosis. And it's like I had to clear my plate. I had to get rid of a bunch of stuff so that I could be focused on this next part of my journey. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, so the slamming of the fist on the dashboard was uh, the wake up call. And I promised my husband, I said, as soon as we get to Florida, I'll pick up the phone and I'll do whatever I have to do. So I called my naturopath when we got here and, uh, you know, I said to her, my husband thinks I have ADHD and I should get tested. And she says, there's a good chance you have ADHD. <laughs> she, she agreed immediately. She said, first thing you need to do is read this book. So it's Scattered mm -hmm. by uh, Gabor Mate. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, I, I, I find his stuff interesting. He's a, he's a bit controversial, but I do find his stuff interesting. Well, I, I understand now yeah. that he's controversial because he doesn't put nearly as much stock in the genetic. Right. He looks at it as trauma. Um, but he doesn't deny entirely the genetic component, you know, and so happens that I have a great interest in health. And uh, so I've been studying health for almost 20 years, probably. And one of the things that I have come across so many times is that when people blame things on genetics, genetics very often is only about 30 percent of the of the puzzle. And the rest of it, of your life, is how it fed into those genetics or how it supported those genetics or how it was an obstacle to those genetics or whatever. So I had always been of that mindset. And I think that's probably where Gabor Mate sits, is that, sure, there's a genetic component, but we know, at least from everything I've read, that you can have people with the genetics that don't develop the ADHD. Why is that? Well, in my mind, it's probably got a lot to do with the nurture aspect. What was the sure, nurture the environment in yeah. which the ADHD nature sat? And if it sat in an environment that was very attentive to his needs, where the mother coddled them and goo goo gaga -ga at them and, and looked in their eyes and really guided them, gave them a lot of attention, then that person probably is not likely to develop ADHD. That's my, my opinion based on what I've read. I'm not a scientist, I admit. But I look at my, my case, you know, my parents, uh, God love them. I mean, uh, you know, they, they never abused me uh, uh, physically or anything. We wanted for nothing. We had nice homes. We had nice clothes. We went to nice universities. Uh, you know, there was nothing missing from that perspective. But there was no attention. My mother basically, you know, when we went to bed, she sent us to bed. She didn't come put us in bed. And I know how she must have raised us by how she reacted to my how my sister was raising her boys. My sister was very much a coddler, uh, giving the kids a lot of attention, a lot of room to explore themselves and making a lot of room for them. And my mother would give her heck because uh, how are they going to grow up? How are they going to be strong if you keep helping them and you keep doing that? So she must have been like that with us. I mean, when I was an infant, obviously, I don't know what she was like, but I can only imagine based on what she became later. So I love her. She taught us good ethics, good morals, but she was remote. She was distant and she was cold, like cold. And my father also, God love him, wasn't cold, but was still emotionally remote and detached. So we had a great family, but there was just that attachment, that emotional attachment. You couldn't talk about emotional issues. My mother told me, you're too deep. Mm, wow. she, she said that to me. You're way too deep for me. Um, well, that sends signals. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, what, what's, what's um, wrong with yeah. you for having these thoughts yeah. and feelings yeah. of trying to understand the world around you and your own internal processes? Um, yeah. Hmm. So, you know, I think that that I was a product of my environment. I don't doubt for a minute that there's a genetic component. When I told my father that I had ADHD, I, and I explained everything to him and he said, do you think I might have ADHD? 
And uh, I said, well, I said, I don't know that you would clinically be diagnosed with ADHD in the sense that you may not have quite enough of the symptoms and they may not be intense enough to get a clinical diagnosis, but there are certainly things there. And my mother, all the more so. My mother had a terrible childhood. She was raised by an alcoholic. You know, she didn't get the attention she needed. That's for darn sure. She wasn't even wanted particularly, I don't think. So I'm sure my mother had elements of, of ADHD. Um, so it's, it, it's not surprising and I don't, you know, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. But all that to say, from my experience, it's not fully genetic. We will be right back. We're talking to Lori Hollingsworth. And uh, when we come back, let's continue talking about how we show up in relationships is that a product of our environment or does sometimes ADHD get in the way? So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Groups and our alumni membership community. And right now we are in the middle of registration for our spring coaching groups with two registration events coming up in the next week. One on this Thursday, February 17th, and the other, which is just for our Oceania friends in and around Australia. And that one is on Monday morning. Here at ADHD Rewired, the mission of our coaching groups is to empower our members and create a safe and supportive environment that's shame-free so that we can learn effective ADHD-friendly ways to live a more productive and wholehearted life. It is the coaching group and community built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD. Before this group, I doubted my ability to grow. I came to the group out of hope, really struggling with who I was and what I wanted to do and feeling uh, stuck. I think I was afraid at first, I, especially with the opening. I was like, oh no, this sounds really scary. If I mess up, they're gonna kick me out. I joined group because I think I'm one of the few people here that uh, was diagnosed as a child and I knew how to handle it as a kid, but I never matured and figured out how to handle ADHD as an adult and what it means to be an adult with ADHD. What I've accomplished in 10 weeks, I didn't do it alone. I did it with all of you. I did it with my A-team. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done but it is the result so far. For me, I've been really positive in the sense that I do believe that I can live without fear. Uh, you realize that like trying to find better tools isn't really just the only solution. It's finding a community, finding people and finding support uh, and learning how to ask for help and learning how to give help better. I think that really helps make a difference. The thing that I learned was I have a place in this world I found a real home that I don't ever have to really leave. I just fully believe in the power of peer support. Uh, I think in order to heal from all the internalized like shame and ableism and the trauma from growing up and not having known your ADHD or really understood it, being around other people who are going through the same thing and healing. And I love you all, so why can't I love myself? I felt such a connection with every single one of you and your stories, and I felt a little piece of my and everything that you guys said and it was at that moment if I had any doubts before that moment that there was a deep connection there and how much we care for and support each other they just taught me to be compassionate with myself and to say hey you know this is a process you know, everyone in the group who's talked about their issue we all then become invested in wanting to see them grow and by proxy wanting to see ourselves grow I can continue to learn and relearn the techniques that have been shared with me here and also continue to receive the support that I've gotten here, which I also didn't know I needed, but I'm so grateful for. I came in expecting to get like a tool belt and then I'd take those tools and go with me, but I feel like more of a different person who has tools that I can use. So thank you all of you for such a wonderful experience. I had a great time with you all. My parting wish is that you would each see the incredible beauty within you and that no matter what others say, that you would find the power in your ADHD because it does come with power that others don't get to have. I don't know if there are directions to a heart, but from the bottom of it, I really appreciate everyone. So thanks, everyone. 
If this sounds like the group of like wired brains you need to be a part of, don't wait. Registration for our spring season is open. To join us for our next registration event this week, head on over now to coachingrewired.com and get your name on our spring interest list. For our friends in the US, Canada, or in and around and in between the Pacific and Eastern time zones, our next registration event for our spring season is this Thursday, February 17th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. And if you are in the Oceana part of the world, your registration event is on Monday, February 21st at 11 a.m. AEDT or UTC plus 11. I am learning all new kinds of ways to figure out and talk about time zones in parts of the world that I've never been. Registration is by invitation only. To get your invitation after you've gone to coachingrewired.com, you'll be asked to confirm your email. From there, you'll receive instructions on everything you'll need to do before you receive your invitation. We ask that all pre-registration requirements for our February 17th event be submitted by Wednesday, 5 p.m. Central. And for our Oceana registration events, we ask that your registration submissions are due Friday, February 18th at midnight. Don't worry. I know those are a lot of dates and a lot of information. All of the details for all the pre-registration requirements will be in the emails that you will receive once you've added your name to our spring interest list over at coachingrewired.com. Registration for all sections is by invitation only. So if you don't want to miss your chance to join us in our upcoming registration events, don't wait. The journey with ADHD may be a long and winding road, but you don't have to go on that journey alone. Come grow with us. Go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. All right, we are back with Lori Hollingsworth. So right before the break, you were uh, sharing with us a little bit about your relationship with your parents and kind of what kind of parents uh, they were for you. Now, when we first uh, spoke, when we had our, our pre-interview, we said that there a lot of times you were accused of, you know, of not being caring, of um, you use the word of being distanced. So, you know, I know there are sometimes times in my own personal relationships that I may come off that way only because it's like out of sight, out of mind, you know, and it's like, oh, I haven't thought about that person because or reached out to them because they're not like in my physical environment, right? How much of, of what you said you've been uh, sort of described in this way do you think is more of unmanaged ADHD versus repeating the behaviors that we grew up with, which is obviously very normal for us to do? Yeah, well, I, I've never pondered this, but I, I have some things that I can definitely share. Um, the irony when you're talking about the environment is as remote as my parents were to me personally, and I can't speak for my siblings. Uh, I have a brother and a sister, and I, I, I've never spoken to them about this, what their perception is. But the, the irony is that my parents were very social. My father is still alive, God love him. He's 93, and he's still very social. So what is that? And I can be very social myself. I can be very gregarious and, you know, given the time and the opportunity, I like to talk to people. I like to learn about them. I like to ask questions. I can be very cheerful and all the rest of it. But in my day to day, I don't have time for people. It took me a long time for me to realize that it's not that I don't like people. I just don't have time for people. The more time I make in my day to chat, the less stuff I get done. And then I'm really in trouble. I mean, now that I have a diagnosis, of course, I have to start coming to terms with that. And I'm hoping that with coaching and, and all the rest of it, but I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, and there's no resentment towards any particular person, but people, oh gosh, how can I put this delicately? Anyway, people, people are in my way. I've got my husband and that's pretty much what I've got time for. And it makes me feel guilty now that I, I know what's going on. I'm re I really, really, really feel guilty about that. So where does that come from? I can tell you that I, as far back as I can remember, have been a, a loner. And I don't know if it's 
I thought it was because I was shy, but really the first inkling I had that there was something weird that was only in reflection many decades later. I have memories, very, very vivid memories at five years of age at Christmas time where all the sides of the family would get together and you've got dozens of people and there's kids all over the house and the kids would be in the basement. There was a pool table, a piano, a bar, you know, you name it. There was all kinds of stuff down there, games and stuff. And all of the kids would gravitate down to the basement and I would sit on the living room floor beside an armchair that one of my parents would be sitting in and I would listen in on the adult conversations. I was five. So whether that's ADHD or shyness, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that childhood bored me to tears. And I never really played. I hated dolls. My sister was very much a normal girl and normal child. She loved to play. She was only three years younger than me. And I used to beat, not beat up on her physically, but, you know, I would berate her. Like, what, what are you doing with those dolls? You know, there's more important things to do, you know, and we're like, six and nine or something you know so i right from the beginning i i had some aversion to people so whether it was shyness or boredom or some other aspect of adhd i really couldn't tell you but that followed me all through my life and uh, high school was mortifying i was absolutely I, I was a basket case i i i just couldn't deal with people at all and i don't know when i came out of my shell um it was after university, somewhere in my late 20s, I guess something happened, I don't know. And I became somebody who could be social, but I'm acting. I said that to the psychologist who diagnosed me two and a half years ago, and it was out of my mouth before I even realized what I was saying. I'd never actually said that, but it was a realization. What did that feel like, like recognizing that? Well, it sort of makes you feel full of shame. You know, what, what, what person on this planet, you're not, you don't come onto this planet to be alone. We're created, you know, and I am a person of faith. We're created to be in communion with each other. We were designed to communicate <laughs> with each other. We were designed to rely on each other, to help each other, to be there for each other to fill in where the other leaves off. You know, I mean, that's all written into our genetic code. And it's, I feel like I don't have any of that part of the genetic code, you know? I mean, I do, I need people, but I don't, I don't feel comfortable with people. What about your husband and how, how, like, what's his social sort of world like? And, and are you sort of included into that or? Well, actually, I guess I chose the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would imagine after 37 years that chose the right guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if either that, Lori, or uh, as someone who was recently divorced, uh, you, you knew what the paperwork was like, so you were avoiding it for years and years and years. <laughs> no, he he had been divorced, I think, when I met him. He, uh, he'd been divorced uh, for four years, or separated okay. anyway. Um, no, I uh, this was my first marriage, and it'll be my only one. But um, he, he also is sort of a loner. And as mm. I've been going through the process of discovering what ADHD is, of course, we have started seeing that some of those components are in him as well. I don't think, uh, again, like my, most of my family, I don't think he would ever be clinically diagnosed because I don't think they're significant enough. But he certainly has uh, traits and he has admitted it himself and will often refer to, oh, that must be the ADHD part of me. <laughs> you know? So we both like being alone. We're neither one of us social and we are our, each other's best company. So that's very fortunate. So I have to imagine then that when, uh, you know, cause when you had this realization of that you're kind of faking in social situations, but I imagine that with your husband of 37 years, you're not faking. Oh, absolutely not. No, I, I'm totally, um, I, I was meant to be a wife. I was meant to have a husband. And uh, no, I, I, uh, that's never been a problem. Never, never, never F for him either. So, you know, we're, we're well suited that way. But I do have the ability to act. He does not. 
And he would admit that. So it does make it hard if we have to be in a social environment because he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And I can roll with the punches. Let's let's <laughs> shift to uh, your history of work. What, what kind of work did you do? Um, so it was mostly accounting. I had studied uh, business of men uh, at university, uh, Bishop's University in uh, Quebec. I um, I never graduated. I don't think that would be a great surprise. I got through the three years uh, and had a nervous breakdown in the middle of my last semester. I you know I mean we haven't gone over the history of the the development of my comorbidities, but from from the earliest childhood, every 10 years, I could tell you there was an added comorbidity and another added comorbidity. So uh, yeah, I fell apart emotionally and um, never, I did try to go back a couple of years later and I wasn't able to finish it. So, but I am a numbers girl. I love numbers. I'm very, very, very good with numbers. Uh, that is where I'm comfortable. So I ended up with jobs in accounting and uh, at one job, they realized they, uh, I was overqualified for the position that they had hired me for. And they said, well, the only job we have is an assistant to the lease administrator, uh, retail leasing. Uh, it was a, a chain of department stores. And I'm like, yeah, well, I know nothing about that. And they said, well, you'll learn. We'll, we'll give you access to the lawyer and you can ask all the questions you want because there's nobody here to train you. I'm like, well, you know what? That's a challenge, right? ADHDers love yeah. that. I mean, I didn't know I was ADHD at the time, but it's no surprise to me now to see how I stepped in that with the greatest gusto. And I used that lawyer so much and I became so expert at managing leases and translating them into terms that the accounting department could use, you know, the, 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 the accounts uh, payable clerks could use to establish if the billing from the landlord was correct or not. So I was this person who didn't know she was a wordy person. I knew I was a numbers person. I didn't know I had words in me. I couldn't compose a, a story, for example. But my God, I got myself into these leases and these legal texts and the puzzle of how the words are shaped together and the comma in the, in the most obscure place can change the whole meaning of the sentence. This puzzle work absolutely enthralled me. And I discovered a whole new world. So it was fantastic because I was able to use my number skills and pair it with this newfound ability to master legalese. And I spent the rest of my career doing that. And you said you, you never lost a job, but you also said that you never got ahead. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I come from a family that has high expectations. You know, my father did very, very well despite very meager beginnings, but he had a great brain. Anyway, he was great. So there were high expectations uh, for us and we had good brains. <laughs> you know, We always did well in school until, for me, until I had a nervous breakdown. Can you talk about that a little bit? You talked about like every, every decade there was a, a new uh, comorbidity. Is that, is that, yeah. Would, would you yeah. feel comfortable sharing yeah. that? Well, that's really important uh, to talk about because in the end, the whole reason I, w I wanted to be on your show was to help anybody who's out there who's hesitant to get their child diagnosed, to help them understand how critical it is to get them diagnosed as young as possible to get them treated. And here's why. So for whatever reason, I came out of the womb hypersensitive. And Gabor Maté covers this very well in his book on, on Scattered. You know, you, you, there's a predisposition in you. So that, that's the genetic part. And you're hypersensitive to begin with. And then it matches up against a family that was very remote emotionally. So that started setting parameters that didn't match up well with the skill set that I needed from a parent. So by the time I was preteen, I would say, I was eating, I had developed an eating disorder. Now, again, we didn't know that it was a de eating disorder. In those days, uh, you didn't talk about eating disorders. We never even heard of anorexia at that point. But I was eating out of sight and I was the only person in the family that was overweight. I was 100 pounds by the time I was 10. 
my mother started hiding food. She started scotch taping packages closed so that if somebody went in there, she could tell that somebody had been in there. So all of the sources of the food that I was eating and hiding were drying up. So I started going elsewhere for my food and I was eating frozen French fries out of the freezer. Mm -hmm. We had a huge a horizontal freezer down in the basement and anything that my teeth were strong enough to eat through in a frozen state, I was eating right out of the freezer. Um, I was eating raw bacon slices out of the, the meat bin mm. in the fridge because I figured, well, my mother's not counting the, the bacon slices, so she won't be able to tell that I ate that. I was eating spoonfuls of sugar out of the sugar bowl because who who's counting how much sugar there is in when the you sugar said bowl. that it um earlier this year i came downstairs my, my son had already woken up and got and was up before me i come downstairs and uh, i catch him in mid act of uh, he he had poured himself a bowl full of syrup and i catch him like taking like a like with the <gasps> spoon to mouth and i'm just like what are you doing <gasps> Oh, are you trying to give yourself diabetes? I was like, oh my gosh. But yeah, you know, it's and it's it's interesting because those I think some of those types of eating behaviors are a, used in a sense to an attempt to self-soothe. I mean, I was definitely like, I oh man, the stuff that I ate when I was a kid. I mean, I would sneak cookies and like just all that kind of stuff. And it's um, it yeah. was tough. Uh, but what became scary is that because the natural sort, the normal sources of food were being uh, hidden from me because they knew I was eating this stuff and I was fat and they didn't want me to be fat and they didn't want to have to chastise me. So they would just hide the food. Well, when you start gravitating to raw bacon and frozen French fries, uh, there's a problem. And of course, nobody knew it. You know, nobody knew I was doing that. So um, it never got corrected. That followed me right through, like I've got a, an obsessive compulsive approach to food that is like, it's always on fire. Fortunately, I've been able to uh, deal with the weight issues, but that doesn't mean that food isn't always on my brain. So that started in my preteens. By the time I was in my early to mid twenties, um, depression had set in. I told you at the end of university, I had had a, um, a mental breakdown in my last semester. And then I went and lived in Spain for a couple of years. And when I came back, I tried to go back to school to finish up that last semester. I couldn't handle it. And that's when I had a complete emotional breakdown. I, I have a three week period in my life that I don't remember. I don't know how I ate. I don't know how I got the money to eat. It's a complete blank. I All I know is that I was alone in my apartment. I had the TV on 24 hours a day. I never got out of my pajamas. And then I woke up from a stupor somehow and got some help. And that was the beginning of the rest of my life. But unfortunately, that's not when the ADHD was diagnosed. So from there, I would say by my 30s is when uh, OCD started setting in. I and I only recognize this in retrospect, right? When I was diagnosed with ADHD two, two and a half years ago, I was also diagnosed with OCD, generalized anxiety disorder, and with uh, mild alcohol use disorder. So it started with the binge eating, it moved on to depression. And of course, not only my life was in chaos, but everybody around me, you know, it was obvious to me that I pissed people off, that I upset them, that I was the one that was upsetting the apple cart. And so you start developing coping mechanisms to try and harness yourself so that, well, when I did that thing and it upset that person, maybe if I apply this thing, maybe I won't do that the next time or whatever. So you start building a life of obsessions and compulsions to meet those obsessions. What was told to me by the psychologist who diagnosed me is that that was basically a coping mechanism mm -hmm. and they were failed coping mechanisms because I didn't know what I was dealing with, right? So that was in my 30s and 40s. And by the time you spent 20 years developing obsessions and compulsions to try and keep yourself within the guidelines of what society expects of you, and you're failing at every turn, that turns into anxiety. 
So I was nervous and upset about everything. I was emotional. I, my, my body was tense, I, you know, and, and it got to the point where I was almost having anxiety uh, attacks. By the time I was diagnosed, I was in the throes of what I would call mild um, panic attacks. Stress is not just emotional, it's physical. Let me tell you, my body was aching. My back was it, it, terrible. So I would drink. So let's take a quick break because I want to kind of wrap up this conversation, kind of looking at so what? We're at 64 years old. You've been through a lot of stuff. Why does it matter now? Because you've gotten to this point. So when we come back, we'll talk about that. We will be right back. <laughs> Support for this podcast comes from our patrons. If you want to support this show because you love the podcast and the work that we are doing, then I would invite you to join us over on Patreon. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And I want to thank our newest patrons. We got Austin M, Jan S, Brandy C, Stacy T. I want to welcome all of you for joining us this week. Welcome to the Patreon community and thank you again for your support. You can become a patron too, starting at any amount with perks starting at just five dollars a month what do you get at five dollars a month well you can get ad free episodes then at 25 dollars a month you can get a taste of group coaching by joining me for a patron only monthly coaching call our next monthly coaching call is on tuesday february 22nd at 3 p.m central that's february 22nd at 1 p.m pacific 4 p.m eastern which means we're only one week away from our next monthly coaching call so if you are a $25 a month and up patron, or you're thinking about becoming one, mark your calendars so you don't forget. Whether it's because of the ad-free episodes, our monthly coaching calls, or simply want to support this podcast because you believe in the work that we are doing, your support is very much appreciated. Perks start at just $5 a month and support can start at any amount. Thank you again to our patrons old and new for all of your support. Consider becoming a patron to support the show by going over to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon or just click the Patreon tab at the top of the page at ADHDrewired.com. And thanks. ADHD Rewired is not alone. We have more podcasts here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, including ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens, and the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with ADHD Rewired Coach Moira Maven. You can find all of the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. Then, every second Tuesday of the month, you can join the ADHD Rewired Podcast family and more of the ADHD Rewired team, including Coach Kat Hoyer and ADHD Rewired's new executive assistant, Lisa Cisla, for our monthly live Q&As. If you want to register to join us on Zoom and ask your ADHD-related questions, head on over to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. There, you'll be able to register for our next live Q&A on Tuesday, March 8th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, and even get reminders for all of our upcoming Q&As after that. If you find a value in the show, don't forget to hit subscribe and share it with your family, your friends, therapist, anyone else you think might benefit from listening. And the know I ask you every week, and it still is always important to us, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast player that accepts reviews. That helps get this podcast in front of other people's earballs. Thank you for listening to the show and to all of our shows. Discover more from ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com. And thanks. All right, we are back. So anxiety, depression, OCD, uh, hypersensitivity, eating disorders, mild uh, alcohol use disorder, and finally ADHD. So at 64 years old, other than your, for your situation, your uh, husband slamming his fist in the car uh, and just kind of had having it up to here with you, um, thinking about the listener who maybe is around your age, because I hear this sometimes from people like, well, you know, I'm, I'm 60 years old or I'm 70 years old. Like I've gotten this far. What's the point? Like, what, why, why do I need this diagnosis? 
for you, what has been different for you now that you've been diagnosed for two and a half years? Um, and you're also on medication too. I, I don't think we've mentioned that. I, I, I am. Um, that was a bit of a process. Um, and we're not done. We're, we're not done uh, with that. Believe me, uh, that, that can be a very difficult journey. Um, the so what for me is that you cannot address something when you don't know what the something is. We're all on a spectrum, right? Everybody is on a spectrum of some kind. We in this group happen to be on an ADHD spectrum that probably includes other comorbidities. And it all depends on how it, is ha it has impacted your life to date. So as I say, my brother doesn't want to get diagnosed because he has dealt with it and made his peace with it, whatever it is, in whatever way it manifests itself in his life. And he doesn't consider his life to be uh, a train wreck, but that's him. My, I knew my life was a train wreck. I didn't want to live the rest of my life. I have big, long genes in my family, and I'm not going to live to 90 and 100 with a train wreck on my hands. But you've got to be ready also to do the work because it is work. And what kind of work when you, when, when you describe that? Well, uh, initially, there was a lot of mourning, yeah. just a lot of crying. For three months, I did nothing but cry. I felt like my life had been wasted, that if I had known this when I was seven, like my nephew found out, and my nephew is so successful today, if I'd known that, my life could have been so different. You have to say goodbye to the past, and you've got to find new ways of living your life. That is not something you figure out in five days. You know, it's not a, a little course that you go and take. So reading and reading and reading and reading and copious conversations with your spouse, because we don't have self-awareness either. That doesn't help when you don't realize that you're doing the things that you don't want to be doing or saying the things that you don't want to be saying or whatever it might be, or making the mistakes that you don't want to be making. If you can't catch yourself in the act, for me, I've got a very patient spouse who, who's helping me along the way. And, uh, you know, we are finding some meds that are starting to show some promise. And um, I'm hoping to get coaching through you and i'm not even sure if i i can't even remember if i registered or not but anyway come hell or high water i know that i'm ready for that now my psychologist uh, said look there's nothing more that i can teach you you know what the disorder is now you need to figure out how to live with it and make your life better and that's where the coaching will come in but this is a journey and you cannot start that journey until you know for sure what it is that's wrong with you. Because it may not even be ADHD, you know? It might be something else that needs some other approach. So for heaven's sakes, if you love your life, it's worth the work. And if you love your child, it's worth the journey mm. for you and for your child. That's I, I, think that's, I, uh, I think that's actually a great place to, to end it right there. Laurie, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your story. You know, it's, uh, there, there was a, a phrase by um, uh, Ari Tuckman that I first heard it from, that, that diagnosis doesn't change your past, but it can change your understanding of the past. And through that newfound understanding, then we can go forward to live the life that we want to live. And you can't do what, anything about what's behind us other than make sense of it. So good for you for moving forward. And if I can add one word, it's not just the understanding. You need forgiveness then. You have to forgive yourself mm -hmm. and you have to forgive the people that might have contributed inadvertently to you being in that place. Forgiveness yeah, is so important. It is. It's because it's a lot of weight to hold. So thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community 
Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.